Good morning, everybody. We'd love to see some people here, given the snow blizzard. And also, we are not in the in the space of the Institute of Future Studies because we have had a word link. Everything has been conspiring against this great talk we're going to have today. So I'm extra happy to have Paul Levine here. He's going to talk about what does the future hold for the Swedish NATO uh, assessment process. And I think actually there's some meeting today about that. So it's going to be uh, extremely uh, current. So Paul is the director of the Institute for Turkish Studies at Stockholm University and also the, the managing director of the Consortium for U European Symposia on Turkey. And uh, of course a frequent commentator and adv advisor on Turkish affairs uh, in Swedish and international media. He got his PhD from the, the School of International Relations at the uh, University of Southern California in 2007. But uh, most important, of course, he also has uh, an undergraduate degree in uh, practical philosophy from Stockholm University. <laughs> so, uh, I think explains all the good comments <laughs> made. Uh, his dissertation uh, was from Saracen uh, Scorch to Terrible Turk, Medieval Renaissance and Enlightenment Images of the Abbey in the Narrative Construction of Europe. That was a little while ago, but it's a long time ago. But again, today, talking about Swedish, Sweden and NATO and Turkey. You're very welcome. Thank you uh, so much, Gustav, for, for, this, uh, for that, those kind words and for reminding me of the title of my dissertation, which I, 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 I can never remember myself. Um, and, and thank you to the Institute for hosting me and having me here. I'm glad uh, we at least got a, a crowd despite the snowstorm that's going on outside. Um, mm. And hi to everyone who's watching a at home. So I'm going to um, talk about the, uh, I'm going to start with a, a brief sort of history explaining, uh, the, the, you know, how we got to the point where we are, uh, the history of the AKP, um, and then talk a little bit about contemporary po politics right now because it is a very exciting uh, time right now in, in Turkey. Um, and then having discussed the politics of Turkey and the upcoming elections, I will then go on to talk about the Swedish and Finnish NATO application and the negotiations that are ongoing. And then I hope we can have a, a discussion. So um, I, I, I find it useful these days to, to think back to the early years of the, the AKP, Ergon's party, Adalet uh, Kalkunma Partisi, the Justice and Development Party, um, which when it came to power was a very different party from, from the one that we see today. Um, Turkey had been a democratic country uh, at that time with multi-party elections since 1950, but it was also a democracy with limitations um, under what is often described as military tutelage. Um, periods of more or less dysfunctional politics, uh, weak coalition politics or uh, a populist uh, uh, leaders who turned increasingly authoritarian, um, and widespread societal strife uh, were interrupted regularly, 1960, 1971, 1980, with striking regularity in fact, uh, by military coups. And those are just the big coups, there have been additional interventions, uh, failed and successful. Um, and even though the military would hand over power rather quickly again to civilian leaders, they also would set the limits uh, for what was considered uh, acceptable politics. So they set the, the broad boundaries of, of uh, acceptable uh, politics in Turkey, secular, non-communist, and non-separatist, uh, if you will. Uh, and the term deep state that you may be familiar with now, and sometimes uh, you hear uh, supporters of, of Donald Trump accuse uh, the deep state in the United States of, of uh, conspiring against him, was coined to describe um, enduring structures in Turkey that included the national security establishment, uh, the but also the elements of the judiciary, uh, the media, um, as well as paramilitary groups connected to the police, uh, the gendarme, and uh, organized crime. So the AKP swept into power in 2002 in the wake, uh, by the way, uh, of a failure of the uh, then left-wing government uh, uh, of Bülent Ecevit to respond adequately to a devastating 1999 earthquake in uh, Izmit, uh, which left at least 17,000 people dead, maybe uh, as many as, as 30,000 people, but also a debt crisis that struck the country in 2001. 
Um, Erdogan came to power one year after his party came to power uh, because he had a verdict against himself. He could not participate in politics until 2003. The early years of AKP rule has been described by, by one Turkish scholars as sort of the golden years. Um, there were a number of democratic reform packages. I think they numbered nine uh, in total. There were openings of EU accession talks uh, in 2005, steady economic growth, low inflation, um, an alliance, a political alliance with uh, liberals, uh, Democrats and minorities, and uh, um, a short-lived but still Alevi opening, opening to one of the smaller or, or the, the re religious minorities in Turkey, and also a serious Kurdish peace process, attempts at which were ongoing um, uh, for a number of years, uh, and I would describe it as the first serious uh, peace process uh, in, in Turkey. But the golden years, as we all know, did not last. Uh, following a clash with the deep state, if we're, we can call it that, um, in a clash with the judiciary, which attempted to close down the AKP, um, and increasing corruption in government and in the party, the AKP turned increasingly authoritarian. Erdogan purged party lists uh, before the 2011 elections, I think it was, uh, and moderates in the party were kicked out. Uh, if before it had been more of a broad tent party, perhaps it became uh, a party uh, of loyalists to Erdogan increasingly. It cooperated, he cooperated with the better educated Gulen movement, uh, a religious uh, Sunni uh, a religious movement in, in Turkey, uh, to pack various parts of the state apparatus, including the judiciary, the finance ministry, and police. And after jointly, together with the Gulen movement, uh, defeating their secular Kemalist opponents in the deep state, if you will, a war over the spoils of victory emerged between the two. The Gulen Erdogan fight uh, turned rather vicious with su successive purges of Gulenists from the state and likely culminated in the attempted coup in 2016. Uh, Erdogan may have had advanced warning of the coup, he may even have let it go on, uh, run its course, but on balance, I would say that it looks like it was initiated by Gulenists uh, who had infiltrated the armed forces. Um, the caveat is, we don't know exactly what happened at th uh, that night. There are still question marks. I don't know if we will ever know, but um, on balance, that is my best uh, es estimation. In 2015, Erdogan lost the majority in parliament. He did so when the pro-Kurdish party, the HDP, the People's Democratic Party, led by the charismatic uh, Silahattin Demirtas, passed the 10%, very high threshold to parliament, the 10% threshold for the very first time. Um, Demirtas also rejected what many thought was an implicit deal between uh, the state and the imprisoned PKK leader, Abdullah Öcalan. And the deal was uh, believed to be that the PKK and the HDP, uh, pro-Kurdish party, would agree to support Erdogan's quest to establish a strong presidential system. He had run out of terms uh, uh, for his, uh, uh, as prime minister and he wanted to establish a, a consolidated power, uh, switch to a president and um, be able to lead the country uh, from that position. But uh, De Demirtas then rejected that deal uh, and vowed very forcefully in a famous and very brief speech uh, that he would not support Erdogan's bid for the uh, presidency. Meanwhile, the peace process with the PKK had stalled due to mutual mistrust uh, and the Turkish National Security Establishment came to view the emergence of a de facto Kurdish statelet in northern Syria led by the PYD, which in Turkey was widely seen uh, and frankly by many analysts as well uh, as the Syrian branch of the PKK. Uh, they came to see this as a core national security threat that had to be dealt with. If the PYD succeeded in establishing a state, Ankara feared that uh, the PKK in Turkey, uh, if, uh, if the PYD succeeded in establishing a state, Ankara feared that the PKK in Turkey might follow suit uh, in Turkey, or perhaps that the statelet in Syria could serve as a staging ground for attacks uh, in, uh, in Turkey. 
we can discuss those that evaluation. Uh, I'd be happy to, to talk about that. Uh, but regardless of what one thinks of that analysis, it became a very uh, a, a strong driving force in, in, in Turkish politics. So if we add to that fear the fact that the HDP no longer was an ally but, but a political threat to Erdogan's quest uh, to maintain a majority in parliament and to create a pol political system, uh, we have the ground was sort of set for a rethink with the relationship with the Kurds, brought writ large, and, and HDP in, in particular. The opposition's hopes, after having won the elections in June 2015 to establish a coalition govern government, uh, failed when the ultra-nationalist MHP, the uh, Nationalist Action Party, bailed the talks. Um, Erdogan called new elections for November of that year, and after a series of horrific terrorist attacks against civilian Kurdish targets, perpetrated allegedly at least by, the s by ISIS, the peace talks formally broke down. Uh, and the state, in response to, to uh, PKK retaliation uh, for the attacks, initiated massive operations against young PKK groups who had done, dug trenches in five city centers uh, in the southeast of Turkey and declared autonomous zones uh, there. The violence in this fighting was brutal, with artillery shelling of Kurdish city centers. Uh, thousands died, with half a million people displaced. And the state literally bulldozing entire blocks, including historic uh, city quarters in, in uh, areas of Diyarbakir and elsewhere. So, we now had a new, have a new um, nationalist conservative uh, political alliance between Erdogan and the MHP, who had bailed the opposition talks. Um, they won the November elections uh, on an anti-terrorist platform and form and amidst a groundswell of nationalist anger directed at the PKK following the resumed fighting. Uh, one year before, in 2014, um, in ISIS had nearly taken the Kurdish uh, town in Syria uh, Kob named Kobane off at the border uh, to Turkey. You might remember this. Um, there were pictures on in, in, in international media of you know, female Kurdish fi fighters uh, fighting against ISIS uh, terrorists, and it became sort of a cause celebre for many, I think, also in the West. Tur meanwhile, Turkish troops stood by and did nothing, nothing to stop them. Uh, Ankara appeared perfectly content to let ISIS defeat what it saw as an even worse threat uh, to itself uh, in the PKK uh, and its uh, allied uh, YPG militia. An international outcry, however, led the United States to provide the Kurdish YPG militia and the all-women's YPG with intelligence and air support. <coughs> that allowed them to push the ISIS fighters back. <coughs> this marked a shift from earlier unsuccessful attempts by the US and Turkey to jointly train and equip um, uh, rebel, rebel groups of in various um, jihadist uh, 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 radical leanings to fight Assad as well as ISIS. Th th that had been attempted. Uh, it was a Turkish proposition. The US uh, worked with Turkey on this, and those were not successful. They were quickly defeated by ISIS. <coughs> Instead, the Kurdish militias in Syria turned out to be much better organized and a better ally in the fight against ISIS. And this shift by the United States uh, followed by other members of the international coalition against ISIS, um, is, I think, at the core of much of Ankara's dissatisfaction and, and disgruntlement with its NATO allies. <coughs> Following the coup in 2016, the attempted coup, Erdogan consolidated his authoritarian grip on power. He described the coup as a godsend, uh, because it, it showed him who the his enemies were. And during uh, an extended state of emergency, he used the power of decree to, among other things, affect purges of dissidents in the academy, as well as, al and along with Gulenists. Anybody connected to or accused of being connected to the Gulen movement was purged from academia, from the state apparatus, and el elsewhere. <coughs> um, a year later, in 2017, he narrowly and controversially won a referendum that introduced this presidential system that he had sought, uh, a highly centralized presidential system. 
and a host of laws restricting internet freedoms, civil society were introduced. Of the 65 mayors uh, that the pro-Kurdish HDP won, uh, only six, uh, I think 48 were deposed. Uh, and instead, uh, the mayorship was taken over by trustees appointed by uh, Ankara. Uh, six additional mayors, uh, HDP elected mayors, were never actually given their mandates, um, and the position was taken up by the runner-up instead, which in all those cases were AKP candidates. <coughs> Thousands of HDP members uh, and activists were jailed, including the party leader, Selahattin Demirtas, and his female co-chair, uh, Figen Yüksekdağ. Turkey was no longer a democracy. However, it is also not a fully-fledged uh, dictatorship, if I'm to use that maybe non-scholarly uh, term, however one which would wish to conceptualize it. Um, competitive authoritarianism uh, or elective electoral autocracy, I think, are better monikers uh, or, or quite widely used. And that means that Turkey has mostly free, with the exception of jailed HDP candidates and a now ongoing attempt to close the pro-Kurdish HDP, but mostly uh, the elections are free, but they are unfair. Uh, uh, we have extensive uh, neo-patrimonialism, uh, cronyism, um, um, uh, state control indirectly uh, of uh, mainstream media, uh, although not all, uh, a large number of imprisoned journalists, but again, not all. Um, uh, the state, uh, or the AKP, I would say, Erdogan ultimately controlled much of the judiciary uh, on, on important cases, um, and, and state institutions have been politicized um, to a, a high degree. So the distinction, I think, matter uh, between sort of, is, is it a democracy or is it a dictatorship or is it somewhere sort of in the authoritarian uh, spectrum in between? Because unlike in China, Belarus, or North Korea, there are still, there is still a viable, if repressed, independent media. There are opposition-aligned media. And um, despite the repression of the HDP, there is a, a viable opposition, uh, which now threatens Erdogan, for real. <coughs> Erdogan does not hold power in spite of elections, but thanks to his ability in the past to win them, that ability is now in question. In terms of foreign policy, the, the, the regime that emerged was characterized by this high degree of centralization, which was particularly uh, prominent in, for in I, or is particularly pronounced in the foreign policy field, where it's Erdogan and a few uh, additional individuals who make decisions. Um, but also the deinstitutionalization of, uh, of, of, of uh, the foreign ministry, for example, where you have a traditionally uniquely sort of competent and, and, and uh, well-respected diplomatic core of uh, civil servants, career civil servants, uh, and a traditional process for making policy that has now been bro uh, you know, broadly sidestepped in favor of high-level decision-making from the top down. Um, the foreign policy in terms of content is, has been increasingly assertive, even aggressive at times, as, as we've seen with respect to Syria. It's a far cry from the type of prudence that Turkish uh, uh, governments in the past uh, have uh, tended to, to abide by. And um, it is also highly and increasingly transactional. No, in other words, it is about deal making. It's about you give me, you, I'll give you what you want if uh, you give me what you, what I want. There are some interesting unintentional consequences of this presidential system that Erdogan so long sought. It centralizes power, but it also creates problems for him. One unintentional consequence is that not only power emanates from the sarai, the, the palace, but also responsibility for when things go wrong. And due to mismanagement in this centralized and personalized system, and what might be described as the deinstitutionalization of it, including uh, economic policymaking, things do go wrong. Uh, populist monetary policy, uh, due to a politicized central bank uh, whose independence has been uh, significantly undercut, uh, has contributed to a dramatic fall in the value of the lira against the dollar and the euro, and to a dramatic return to the superinflation that we had in earlier decades before the arrival of the AKP. <coughs> 
economic growth was strong, uh, but it was built on fixed investment and artificial stimulation through a, a burgeoning construction se sector, uh, where bribes and cronyism were staples and political loyalty to the AKP trumped competence and rule following. Some of the rules that were ignored in the construction sector concerned earthquake building codes. These had been in truth, in truth after this 1999 uh, Izmit earthquake that I spoke of earlier, where the dead were buried under the rubble of shoddily constructed buildings. Um, but as it has been widely reported, these rules that were established were regularly ignored or bent uh, and the AKP government uh, over the past 20 years has initiated a series of amnesties uh, for rule breakers. They could get away if they simply paid a fee. Uh, that was a welcome addition to the state coffers, but did little to improve the safety of the buildings. A special earthquake tax had been introduced, and it was supposed to be used to retrofit and renovate uh, 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 vulnerable buildings. It was collected but it is unclear if the money went to where it was supposed to go. The increasing politicization and hollowing it out, out of institutions then has had real effects. For example, Ismail Palakolu, the general manager of disaster response at the uh, Disaster and Emergency Management Presidency, AFAD, he is trained as, not a philosopher, but as a theologian, uh, and he had previously worked at the Directorate of Religious uh, Affairs. Several provincial Afad heads have graduated from rel religious Imam Hatip schools um, and pos other positions were given to relatives of top AKP uh, politicians. So this um, deep institutionalization, cronyism has real world consequences. And a second unintended consequence of this new presidential system was that it introduced bottlenecks. You would think that a you know, one-man system would be powerful and effective. You could just take quick, swift, decision, swift decisions. <coughs> but somebody told me once, I don't know if it's true, but they said that Erdogan gets several hundred items, decision items on his desk every day. And he is not able to get through even uh, a, a sort of a fraction uh, of it. He becomes a bottleneck. And he appear to appears to have become a bottleneck in the uh, initial response to this devastating earthquake. So let me talk a little bit about that earthquake. Um, two devastating earthquakes struck uh, the, the town of, um, they centered around the town of, of Marash, Kahraman Marash, on February the 6th. Um, both of them were very sizable. Um, and both the bottlenecks in the presidential system and the deinstitutionalization and politicization of the state apparatus hampered the initial response, one could argue. The suppression of independent civil society also hurt independent aid efforts that attempted to circumvent uh, the slow state initial response. Eleven cities were hit. Uh, Turkish, Kurdish, Arab and Alevi uh, populations in these uh, uh, cities. Half of all of the country's 3.7 or so million Syrian refugees live in areas affected by the earthquake. Um, some have even now fled back to Syria uh, because uh, the, the situation has been so difficult in Turkey for them. And since then, there have been, uh, I think, over 7,500 uh, aftershocks, including two, or I should say, as well as two additional earthquakes that are, uh, are considered so big that they are, uh, are regular earthquakes in their own right. And the official death toll stands at over 46,000, last I checked, that's a day or two old. But the true figure is, of course, higher. We don't know how much higher, but it might be multiple times higher uh, than that, several multiples. Nearly two million people are displaced and more than 160,000 buildings were wholly or partially destroyed. It is really difficult to fathom the, the destruction. The World Bank has estimated the cost of damages for <coughs> only the two main earthquakes at 34 billion US dollars. A Turkish business organization puts the damage at 84 billion dollars or 10% of Turkey's GDP. Um, the state and the people of Turkey is in desperate need of help in immediate aid and long-term reconstruction. And EU and NATO allies, including Sweden, have stepped up uh, and provided er er much needed uh, aid uh, in the initial stages. And Sweden, as the holder of the rotating EU presidency, has now called a, a major international donor conference that will be held in Brussels this month. 
uh, to further that work. <coughs> the earthquake came only months before one of the most hotly anticipated elections in Turkish uh, history. It's almost a joke now for people studying Turkey to say that this election is pivotal. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, uh, many elections are, and this one certainly is. The ailing Turkish economy meant that uh, Erdogan standing in the polls before the earthquake was already poor. He had seen a, uh, a rise in the poll numbers uh, and, uh, and a slight momentum due to uh, a recover economic recovery. <coughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I've spoken about the fact that the centralized pre presidential system puts the spotlight on Erdogan when things go wrong. And a third unintended conse consequence of this system um, that he himself installed is that he won't be able to count on a high threshold to parliament and coalitions to cobble together a majority. When he first came into power, he got single-handedly, AKP got over 50% in parliament with only, I think it was 34% of the popular vote due to uh, the high level th threshold and many parties not getting into parliament and therefore their votes being spoiled. Um, now he needs a majority. So if he cannot gather, uh, uh, garner a over 50% in the first round of the presidential uh, election, which few polls in, the rec in recent years have given him, <coughs> I think the last time was in 2019, <coughs> he will face a runoff against a single candidate around which the opposition can rally. <coughs> and that looks to be a difficult task for him. The opposition has gotten organized into what they call a table of six. It's a motley crew uh, of everything from Islamists uh, to uh, conservative former Erdogan ministers who have jumped ship and uh, were being kicked out, um, as well as a large ultra-nationalist party that splintered from this MHP that sided with Erdogan in 2015. Uh, and it's led by the Kemalist uh, Social Democratic uh, Party, the, S the Republican Pe People's Party, or the CHP. And this coalition, just two days ago, finally, and after some last-minute drama, agreed to put forth a jo joint candidate. <coughs> this was the rather lackluster and aging leader of the largest party, the CHP. He's a candidate for who, for all his mediocrity, perhaps as a campaigner, still has been able to unify the opposition. The only major opposition party that is not uh, in, in the table of six is the pro-Kurdish HDP that I spoke about. Uh, and this is, I think, pretty much by mutual agreement, um, as it would be equally difficult for the HDP to sit down with the Turkish ultra-nationalists as it would be, be for the latter to sit down with the HDP. I think that the, the Kur Kurdish pro-Kurdish party, HDP, is likely to field their own candidate in the first round. Um, and I think that they do so because they intend to show the rest of the opposition how strong they are. They might get s s you know, around 10 to 12 percent. Um, and they want to show the opposition that their vote is uh, needed to defeat Erdogan in a second round. And with that, gain a better uh, bargaining position uh, in order that the next opposition, uh, if there is such an, an, an opposition victory, the next government will not be able to ignore the Kurdish issue. They want a reboot of, the peace, uh, of a peace process. The most recent poll came out only yesterday. It showed the opposition candidate at 56%. It's only one poll, uh, and polls in Turkey want you to take with a big grain of salt. Uh, but it showed uh, the opposition candidate leading Erdogan by 13 percentage points. That's a big lead. And the momentum that Erdogan appeared, appears to have had before the uh, earthquake has been uh, reversed, it seems. So while Erdogan has control over the Yüksek Seçim Kurulu, the high uh, the election authority, while he also controls the courts, it would be very difficult for him, I think, to try to bridge that kind of a gap through foul play. We have seen alleged instances of foul play in the past, uh, I including local elections in Ankara 2015 and perhaps also in this referendum 2017 over the presidential system, but those were close calls. And 
Um, it's useful to look back at the, uh, the most recent local elections uh, in, in Turkey, where the opposition was uh, very adamant on uh, sending election observers, watching every single ballot, and he lost most of the big cities, including the jewel in the crown, Istanbul, the city where he once made his own political star. And um, he, that was not something that he was happy with. Uh, and he lost, the uh, his candidate lost the election with a few thousand votes, I think it was 13,000 votes. Erdogan uh, cried foul and uh, demanded uh, not only a recount but a new election. There was a new election uh, and the opposition candidate won by 800,000 votes. So, uh, clear miscalculation by Erdogan and also quite a humiliating strategic uh, uh, loss. So he is mortal. So, um, all scenarios for elections are possible, I would say. It's possible that we see another Erdogan win. He has won all major elections, uh, uh, national elections in, in the past. He controls the state and he will use the state's uh, entire resources in uh, his favor. But it is also possible that the gap is too big, that he cannot uh, win. And so it's also possible that we might see a democratic transition of power in an authoritarian state, something which does not happen often. It has happened, but it's, it's uncommon. Uh, it's also possible that Erdogan, realizing that he might not be able to uh, win, will postpone the elections. Um, unclear for how long. Uh, the Constitution prohibits uh, a, a longer postponement, but it now he now says that he intends to go through with an early election date, May 14th. They're going to decide, I think, uh, uh, tomorrow. It's also possible that we have an opposition win followed by a refusal by Erdogan to accept it, of course. Right? We've seen attempts uh, uh, of that in, in Brazil and, and, and the United States. And uh, there is a lot at stake for Erdogan uh, right now. Uh, and the latter two scenarios, a long postponement or refu refusal to simply concede, uh, could be associated with significant societal unrest and instability, uh, which is quite worrying. Uh, also, from a sort of European perspective, uh, well it's a country of uh, 85 million uh, uh, on, on the on, uh, uh, on, on Europe's eastern, uh, southeastern sort of um, flank. So let me then talk a little bit about what this uncertainty means for the future uh, of the Swedish NATO application. Uh, it means that it's very difficult to predict right now, I, I think. Uh, in, in short, I, I have, uh, I, I think may, many of you have, may have seen the, the paper that I, I uh, sent out uh, last night. If you haven't, it's a short uh, uh, paper. I won't go into the sort of explanation for why Sweden decided to join NATO. I'll be happy to talk about that. Uh, it's not really my, my area of expertise, but, but I'll be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But I want to talk about why Turkey is blocking the Swedish and Finnish uh, accession process. Well, it's primarily, of course, as, y as you know, the Swedish uh, accession that uh, Erdogan is blocking. And I, I have four theories why it might be. Um, and here, the, the nature of Turkish foreign policy making that I described earlier, the deinstitutionalization uh, of foreign policy, means that it's very difficult to predict and understand uh, and interpret because it's one man who's made the decision, perhaps in cahoots with a few, under, uh, a few others. Uh, that makes it very difficult to read and interpret. Uh, it means that we are uh, engaging in criminology or sarayology. We are guessing. Um, and uh, also the Turkish uh, increasing transactional nature of foreign policy making is something that we see very clearly here uh, throughout these, these, um, uh, the, these explanations. The first explanation... Oh, would you explain transactional? So transactional is, is simply this, this kind of a bizarre mentality, if you will, the, d the, the deal making, right? I'll give you what you want, but only if you give me what I want, as opposed to sort of we're allies, we share values, we are in this together, we have a long-term sort of uh, enlightened self-interest um, uh, that collaboration in the long run will be good for, for both of us, and I'll make some, some uh, concessions uh, uh, you know, right now uh, in the hope that it will be benef beneficial for all of us in the long run. Uh, Erdogan is very transactional, very uh, focused on making deals. So the first explanation, I think, and uh, I, I don't think one can dismiss this, is that I think Ankara really means what it says. 
when it criticizes Sweden. I think I might stand out a little bit among Turkey analysts. Many Turkey analysts tend to, s to dismiss the, no the notion that this is actually about Sweden and the PKK um, and say it has to do with other things. Uh, and it, it, I agree, it, it has a, a sort of, you know, it's, an, uh, it has, it, it's a degree of naivete perhaps, <laughs> just to say, I'll take Erdogan on his word. But the thing is, the PKK issue in Turkey is such a deeply emotional issue and it's such a uh, core national security interest according to the Turkish national security establishment that one should not ignore it, I think. Um, and as we have seen, the, the disagreements over allies w uh, regarding the, the relationship to the PYD, which Turkey then views as the PKK in Syria, has been uh, at the core of, of disagreements. And Turkey has blocked NATO plans on two earlier occasions, and in both cases, cases it either had to do with the PKK and YP or PYD, or uh, the solution included um, concessions on those fronts. Turkey has pursued uh, what has been described as intra-alliance opposition uh, in, on, on these areas. It has opposed uh, the, the rest of the alliance, but it remains within the alliance. So it doesn't oppose it from outside, but from in the inside. And I would describe maybe its maximalist aims, what it would love to get out of, of uh, this veto, to be that the U.S. and other NATO allies cut its ties with the PYD or and YPG militia in northern Syria. But I also think that it knows that it is unlikely to get that. Um, and I think that it has minimal aims, which would be to get Sweden to crack down on the PKK, which has been allowed to operate quite freely in some respects in Sweden. I heard from from actually Kurdish activists many years ago about the PKK uh, allegedly running a protection racket in Stockholm, uh, pressuring Kurdish and Turkish owned restaurants uh, in, in the city for money. And it's also of course the case that many Kurds in Sweden, not all, uh, but many Kurds view the PKK as a legitimate uh, resistance movement against Kurdish oppression by the Turkish state. Uh, and therefore voluntarily donate funds for the cause, some of which go to the PKK or to the, the PYD, YPG in Syria. All right, so that's the first explanation. Um, and then there's the domestic politics explanation, and it's tied together. And I think because the PKK is such a, wi is widely perceived as such an existential threat across party lines, not just Erdogan's uh, party, uh, in fact, he was criticized by many of the opposition parties for negotiating with the PK when PKK when he did so. Um, because that is the case, um, being tough on Sweden uh, on the when it comes to the PKK works, uh, and he's coming up for this difficult re-election campaign. So I think that's the second possible explanation. A third possible explanation is that he really wants something else, right? That Sweden and the NATO accession case is just a useful leverage for him to make other uh, demands on uh, primarily the United States. And what's commonly talked about here is this um, the uh, um, aircraft system, the, the fighter system that, that Turkey wants. Um, the Turkey was kicked out of the fifth generation F-35 uh, fighter jet consortium that it was part of and he had uh, uh, contributed to uh, because it had purchased Russian S-400 missiles, anti-aircraft missile systems, despite U.S. warnings not to do so because it, it would be inoperable, incompatible with this new fighter jet. But as consolation for that, er, Turkey now hopes to get the older F-16. It already has F-16 fighter jets uh, in its, um, in its uh, fleet, but it, is, um, uh, it needs modernization kits for its older F-16s and also new F-16s. Um, and armaments for its F-16s. But that is held up in Congress, and one interpretation is that Turkey at least hopes to get those uh, in return for letting Sweden and Finland in. Finally, the person who stands most to gain from uh, the, 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 the veto on NATO expansion, arguably, is, is Vladimir Putin. And Russia has leverage on Turkey on a number of fronts. I'm not going to go into the, to the details. I can do that in the Q&A. But it's quite possible <laughs> that this also plays into Erdogan's thinking uh, when he vetoes succession. 
it's, it is, however, r useful to recall that Turkey has now said that it is willing to let Finland in. So I think that that move under, slightly at least, undermines the, the latter interpretation, because if he really wanted to placate Putin, he would not likely let Finland in. I also think that it weakens his hand vis-a-vis -vis the United States if he wants to get the F-16s. Uh, but it works with the first two explanations, that really what they do want are concessions on the PKK, uh, and that that is important also for domestic politics in Turkey. That's my take. I may be wrong. I, as I said, we're speculating. So uh, one question I often hear I is people in, in, in ex exasperation are asking, why are we even negotiating with Turkey? We're joining NATO. We're not nego we're, you know, joining Turkey. Um, well, so Turkey made demands on Sweden. <laughs> primarily. Finland also, but primarily sw Sweden. Um, and Sweden early on got signals from the United States that it would was not interested in uh, sort of a stepping in between. Uh, I think that the United States, Biden did not want to be a target of, uh, uh, of blackmail, if you will, from Turkey. He also feared that the U.S.-Turkish relations were so bad that if t the U.S. intervened, it actually may actually hurt uh, prospects uh, for NATO accession rather than help it. So I Sweden was told, uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, behind the scenes that, look, you need to, s to first negotiate with Turkey. You need to, you're trying to join an alliance of which Turkey is a ma member. Turkey is expressing uh, national security concerns. The alliance typically talks about those as legitimate national security concerns. And a new member can't come in and say, we dismiss that. You have to talk to them and address them. And I think also, by negotiating with Sweden, Sweden was also sending a signal to other NATO allies. And when you speak to diplomats from some other uh, NATO uh, countries, they actually express some understanding for Turkish tur uh, Turkey's concerns. They do think that Sweden has been unduly lax on the PKK, uh, interestingly enough. So I think by making this wholehearted effort to negotiate, uh, which you know has been received in, uh, uh, receiving a lot of criticism in Sweden from ma from, from many quarters, uh, it was also a signal to other allies, including the United States which then on the eve of the NATO summit in Madrid in June of last year could step in and offer the last little incentive. At that time it was you know, a promise to try to push the F-16s through and also uh, a, 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 a meeting with, with uh, Biden, which Erdogan desperately wanted. And there, with that last little push and the Swedish concessions, um, the Social Democratic government at that time enabled to get Turkey's signature on this trilateral memorandum uh, where Sweden and Finland specified what it agreed to do in order to uh, alleviate Turkey's concerns and um, thereby become invitees. So it is thanks to that memorandum that Sweden is now, uh, has now been, the, the accession protocols have now been ratified by 28 member states. Only two remain, Hungary and Turkey, right? Um, so the memorandum, by the way, was a proposal, I understand, by the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. He, it was his idea. And though one can criticize it for being rather vague, um, it the vagueness of it allowed a quick ad agreement to be made. It also makes it difficult to, to determine when Sweden is done implementing it, right? So that's kind of kind of part of, of the problem. But I also think that it's been very, I think the Swedish government and foreign ministry has been very grateful to have this memorandum because we've always heard Erdogan, or often heard Erdogan make additional demands, uh, sort of new demands about this person needs to be extradited. 30 people, 70 people, 100 people need to be extradited to Turkey. And what Sweden can do uh, and has done is to say, okay, we hear you, uh, and we promise to implement the memorandum in which it doesn't say anything about those new demands. Um, I don't have time, so you, if you, uh, I have a few minutes left, but um, to uh, really sort of look at what Sweden has done in the policy uh, paper that I sent out uh, to you, I have, a, I have a, a table where I go through the seven concrete uh, items that uh, Sweden committed to do, and I sort of make an evaluation on those. And the summary evaluation would be uh, that I think right now the Secretary General of NATO and, and, uh, and the Swedish Prime Minister is, are right in saying that Sweden has taken action on all seven fronts. Um, 
Has it concluded implementation on all those fronts? Well, some of these uh, steps include, you know, you know, commitments to fight terror consistently. I mean, when can you be said to have implemented that? So it's very hard to, to determine. And at some point, I think Ankara will just have to make a decision that, well, we trust that you will continue to implement this. You know, actual implementation is an ongoing process that could go on forever, and we're not going to wait uh, forever. So we've had a deep crisis uh, in the negotiations uh, and uh, a pause uh, for a few months after these um, these um, the, the demonstrations in Sweden where people waved PKK flags, hung an effigy of Erdogan by its feet, uh, along with a threatening video saying that, uh, you know, pictures of, of, uh, of uh, Mussolini hanging also, his dead body hanging upside down, uh, saying that uh, this will be your fate too uh, if, you, if you don't resign. Um, but then also demonstrators rolled out huge pictures of Erdogan's face and walked on, treaded on them on the streets of Stockholm. Uh, and of course, we had the, the infamous Koran uh, burning incident. Uh, this all led to a deep crisis, but the earthquake and some time appears to have cooled sentiments off a little bit and talks have now, uh, uh, you know, will now be resumed. And um, the deleg Swedish delegation, led by Oskar Stenström and the National Security Advisor, I believe, will be meeting uh, with uh, their counterparts in, in Ank uh, from Ankara and, and Helsinki um, <coughs> in Brussels today. And today is also where I think the Swedish government is uh, presenting and uh, will make a decision on the new, the last bit of anti-terrorist law um, that it has proposed. A law, by the way, that was criticized by the uh, Legislative Council in Sweden, uh, an advisory council, um, um, but they intend to go through with, with it anyway. Um, yes, so I'm sort of out of time, um, and I... Don't worry too much, take a bit more time. Take a bit more time, yeah. I, I mean, what I have it will, will take a little bit too long, maybe. Um, but of course, I mean, one of the, the big questions in Sweden, and for many people in Sweden, um, is what this will mean for the Kurds, both in Sweden and in Turkey and in Syria. If Turkey moves forward with uh, closing down the HDP, for example, with the current, will the current Swedish government uh, you know, object strenuously, as they probably would have um, otherwise? Um, and, um, you know, there's fears among many Kurds in Sweden that Kurdish uh, activists might be extradited or deported. Uh, I think those fears are somewhat uh, uh, exaggerated. No Swedish citizen will ever be extradited. I think we won't see any extraditions at all of terrorist suspects. But we have seen deportations of uh, terrorist suspects, uh, people accused of links to the PKK. I don't know the evidentiary basis because it's a sample that makes that those determinations and they're classified. Um, but we saw one person being deported in 2020, so far before the, the, this uh, process started. And we've seen two people being deported since this process uh, started. Sapple's determinations in those cases predate the current negotiations. They go back one or two years. So uh, the migration agency, and uh, SAPA doesn't say anything, but the migration agency says that we're implementing uh, laws, we're not violating uh, the autonomy of agencies, uh, we're not facing undue pressure. One person was supposed to be uh, extra uh, or deported, and then the migration ag agency decided that he would be, f you know, face persecution or risk face persecution if uh, sent home. So he was given extended uh, permits to stay. But there are some 30 or so Kurds in Sweden who have either sought asylum or residency for other reasons, where SAPL, the Swedish security services, have made a determination, classified again, that they have ties to the PKK. And those 30-some people do face potential deportation. So I do think that we can expect for more deportations. Um, and I think that it, it would be fair to say that at least the, um, this, I sort of, you know, uh, this, uh, autonomy of Swedish agencies, that is at the hallmark of, of it, sort of the unique Swedish model of public administration, I have a publication on that, believe it or not, uh, is now at least being challenged. 
I don't think that there's evidence to say that it has been uh, undermined or or, um, um, uh, or or weakened, but it is being challenged right now, and uh, we'll have to see uh, how well it uh, it holds up. So I think I'll stop there, and uh, then we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much, and uh, we're now going to go to the question and answer period, and we have a. Uh, both uh, people online and people here. To you online, it should work as usual that you write the question in the chat. And please uh, write your, uh, since you like to field questions from different fields, please write your field and, uh, and also your name, of course. We also take your follow-up questions. That's a thing you're here in the, if you're here, or just write follow-up and then the person will follow up if you write it in the, in the chat box. And uh, and if there is your turn question, I will, we will just put you especially online here so you can see. Uh, well, so we're going to start here. Actually, I'm going to take up maybe quickly to ask a question of a little bit what, what you said about I thought was uh, interesting, but I wasn't clear uh, uh, what, what you said. I mean, one question is the probability of, uh, of if Erdogan had a clear electoral loss, will he resign? And what is his power to stay? And the second one is, given the earthquake, why can't they postpone the elections uh, having some kind of state of emergency thing? Well, uh, you said, you know, constitutionally you can't postpone it very much, much further, but uh, if it was a state of emergency, I would guess he could. And I, I was actually rather surprised that he still says he's going to have it in 14 minutes. Uh, I, I think those are good questions. Uh, you know, Good questions, and I don't know if I have the answer to that question, so I would say I would uh, amplify the questions uh, and hope to get an answer somewhere. But if I were to attempt to answer them, um, and again, I mean, it is, it is speculation. What is the problem? I mean, this is something I, when I speak to people in Turkey who are sort of in the know, this is what I ask, ask them. Because, I mean, it's an extraordinary situation. We might have a situation where we have a leader who cannot win, I'm exaggerating. It's at least a, it could be a tight race potentially, but it could be that he cannot win, <coughs> and that he cannot afford to lose, right? <laughs> so that is a potentially very, very volatile situation. Um, and uh, you know, what is he willing and able to do if, in order to to stay in power? I think that's, um, you know, when I, uh, some people that I speak to uh, believe. Uh, and, and frankly, the interesting thing is m most people who are in Turkey are a little bit more sanguine about this than who people, who experts outside and also uh, people in exile. Um, the people in, in, in Turkey, including the, the, the opposition supporters, they seem to think that he does not have the ability and he would not be able to use the military, the state, the, the, the monopoly of violence, if you will, of the state uh, to remain in power. I mean, you have to understand that you know, while there have been you know, military coups, the military coup in uh, 1960 was after a you know, s center-right uh, um, politician became increasingly authoritarian and started jailing opposition leaders and, and so on. And the, and the, and, and the, the mi military coup was violent. They, uh, they killed the, the uh, President uh, Mendez, but the... Um, they also instituted a more liberal constitution and handed over power. Uh, the, the, the very violent uh, coup in 1980 was in response to widespread societal dis, uh, uh, violence and unrest, where some 30 people every day got killed in street fights between right-wing and left-wing uh, extremist groups and so on. Uh, so you know, there was a degree of understanding among segments of the Turkish population for, okay, let's, you know, the military comes and sort of takes care of this, this, this frightening situation. That is not to diminish the suffering of the many people uh, in, uh, uh, who, who suffered under the coup in 1980. Um, and I mean, I have personal, uh, I have relatives who fled the coup, so. Um, but um, now I, I think I might, might have lost my train of thought. I was going somewhere. Um, it's in response to, yeah, so does he hold, does he, you know, Probability that he will sign up and let the law. Yeah. Why can't he postpone? Why? That's the like second question. But yeah. yeah so, so to, to answer, finish answering the first question, um, he his legitimacy has come from the fact that he's been able to win elections. He has been able to portray himself as a popular, populist, 
uh, uh, president who has broad support among the people in Anatolia um, and so on. The Black Turks, as they, they, they you know, sometimes call themselves against the, the elite in, in the, the big cities. Um, and to sort of shift entirely and move from a, an authoritarian system where you claim some kind of legitimacy through populist support and uh, popular support I I to a full, fully fledged, you know, I stay in power by, by violence. It is not certain that the military and the, the, uh, the, the security establishment will go for it. Uh, Hulusi Akar, the Minister of Defense, it's a little bit, uh, he's not necessarily, as we know, entirely in Erdogan's pocket. Um, uh, same thing with uh, Hakan Fidan, the he head of intelligence. Uh, he did not come in as, as Erdogan's uh, you know, personal sort of uh, ally. They've shown themselves loyal, but the extent of their loyalty, it's unclear. So I, I think it's a good question. I don't know the answer, but a lot of Turkish insightful people think that he can't probably cannot. Uh, yeah. I don't know if they're right. Right. The second question, why did he not postpone the elections? Yeah, I, I still can. Uh, he still can. I mean, tomorrow they're going to, um, they're, uh, I, well I hear that the, the, high, uh, the election uh, authority is going to make the decision. And it, you know, he's still saying that it's going to be May 14th. I think, I mean, uh, like you, I mean, if he sees that he can't win on May 14th, why would he go on with the election? But the Constitution does not allow for a longer uh, postponement. I think it allows for, there, you know, in Turkey, there's this thing called OHAL, the state of emergency. Uh, there are different categories, uh, and the Constitution does not allow for a, a postponement for, I think, longer than a month due to uh, emergencies like natural disasters. It has to be a war. So, I mean... There is the, the, there's the wags the dog theory, uh, um, right, that he will start some kind of a war. And before the earthquake, I mean, there was a lot of saber rat rattling between Greece and Turkey. Greece also uh, heading to elections, I think. I don't know exactly when, when they, they are. But uh, that was a fear. But earthquake diplomacy, Greek aid to Turkey, uh, Greek rescue workers, uh, um, you know, uh, being there and rub pulling people out of rubble and the Greek foreign minister visiting Turkey, offering his condolences, all of those things that make it m would make that more difficult. Uh, also, I think there's very little appetite in Turkey right now, given the magnitude of this horrible disaster, to invade northern Syria, which Erdogan has been wanting to do for a long time, but has been stopped by the U.S. and, and Russia and Assad. So... I, yeah, I might be an unlucky guy. All the roads are closed off. Yes, so I mean, it's not a, if I were Erdogan, I would not be uh, content right now. Um, so, but, you know, safe to bet. It has been safe to bet on Erdogan for 20 years. He holds all the levers of power. Who knows? Um, who knows what, what he might pull off? Okay, come back to that. But uh, I'm going to give the word to Folke. Now, how does that work with the microphone now? Uh, so if Polka, can you speak with his loud uh, and very so. impressive voice? Yes. Thank you so much for this presentation. So interesting. I, I have two just questions about the background. Um, I'm, I don't know much about Turkey, uh, uh, but and I feel that I need a little bit more. Uh, and one is, uh, what does uh, Erdogan, could you say a little bit about this? What does uh, Erdogan ultimately want, I mean, besides just remaining in power or, I don't know, remaining alive, perhaps, or out of jail, does he have some grand plan of some sort? I mean, uh, Putin talks about this uh, multipolar world, and he, he seems to have some sort of ideology, old Russian imperialism, I don't know. Uh, so that's the first question. The second question is, what role, if any, does religion play in this? I mean, is it just a vehicle for affecting votes or are there dimensions of this problem that might be relevant to you? Okay, thank you. Um, and, and by the way, if, if there were any uh, sort of philosophical uh, or logical flaws in my reasoning, blame Folke because uh, he was, I think, my, my professor <laughs> back in the day. So uh, That explains a lot. Uh, it, ex exactly. Uh, um, well, so what does he want? Yeah, very good question. I mean, he does have a grand sort of uh, scheme. It's, it's not a very clearly fleshed out cohesive ideology ne necessarily, but um, he has this vision of a new Turkey, Yeni Turkey. Um, and, you know, this year, 
uh, was supposed to be the celebration, uh, I think it, it's in October, is the celebration of the 100 year of the, the birth of the Turkish Republic, right? And some AKP you know, politicians in the past have talked about the Republican era as a parenthesis. And it goes to your second question also, by the way. I mean, between the Ottoman Empire and this new great Turkey that reaches back to its Ottoman past, embraces that, um, and uh, you know, you know, where religion has a much greater role, uh, among other things. There, in terms of foreign policy, um, so I mean, it's a, a society that already is, is um, you know, where where conservative values, and I mean, on this day, uh, International Women's Day, I think maybe it's important to, to note that also, that. I mean, the situation for, for women has been, you know, made in many respects much worse under the AKP. It's a, it's a very conservative government, uh, and, um, you know, it championed long time, uh, for a long time, it championed itself as a, uh, a sort of champion of women's rights because it fought for the right of women to wear uh, hijabs, scarves. Turban in, in Turkish, uh, uh, in, in public places in Turkey, uh, I mean, courts, courts and uh, military uh, barracks and, and, and uh, universities and so on. And I mean, and that was a, you know, a discriminatory measure that was uh, implemented by very strongly secularist regimes prior to this. Um, but apart from that sort of, you know, reform, the women's movement has been um, crowded out. I actually wrote a report for the expert group for foreign aid analysis together with Osa Elbian uh, on civil society and the shrinking space for civil society. And one of the things we found was, you know, L LGBTQ plus uh, organizations and people were very threatened uh, with violence and so on. And they found their room to maneuver and, and, and um, exist essentially publicly very circumscribed. Um, uh, whereas women's organizations could still uh, exist, uh, women's rights organizations fighting against, uh, you know, violent violence against women and so on, but their their ability to function was threatened by crowding out by gongos, government organized uh, NGOs, if you will, uh, or organizations, women's organizations and family organizations that were close with close ties to Erdogan's fa own family uh, and they became huge and you know just to take a concrete example when it came to who is going to represent Turkey on in UN women's uh, panels and, and organizations well then those gongos would take up many of those spots leaving less for these traditional women's rights organizations we've seen a growth in violence against women which has been quite spectacular but it's difficult to determine whether that is because of increased reporting or an increasingly sort of acceptance of conservative um, values. The religious agency in Turkey, the, 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 the presidency, Diyanet for Religious Affairs, has v ballooned uh, you know, in, in budget. Uh, I think it's, I don't know how many times, but it's six times the size it was before. And it shrinks many other departments, important departments uh, and ministries. Um, and, um, so religion has played a very important role. There has been an expansion of these religious schools w that were originally main to tr uh, intended to train imams. Uh, th therefore, they're called Imam Hatip schools. But they became came to be an alternative to uh, regular schools instead, and they do not necessarily offer very good training. Um, so. Um, you know, Turkey is not, you know, operating under Sharia law or anything like that. Um, and there's a strong sort of secularist tradition. Uh, but the secularist tradition in Turkey is, is uh, different from what you might think of it. I, Turkish secularism was always that the government took charge of uh, religion through this Diyanet, this, this directorate. So all the imams and all the Friday prayers and so on are produced by Diyanet and then read by, by the imams and so on. Uh, and that was a way for earlier secular governments and also after the, the coup in 1980, er, earlier, uh, later right-wing governments, to take control of, of religiosity, sometimes use it uh, to fight communism uh, and, and so on. In, in the 1980s, um, but uh, also make sure that it doesn't be become a threat to the state. With Erdogan, I would say it has become part of the state, so it is an integral element. But Erdogan, you know, uh, he's, a, he's a power politician, he's also a pragmatic politician, 
Uh, so, you know, piousness is part of their appeal, uh, and but um, it's, uh, you know, you, you, it's it's not um, it's not uh, I think perhaps essential to their 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 the way that they run rule the country. Happy with that, Falken? Then let me just follow up on that because something you didn't mention in your talk, and maybe because it's nonsense, uh, but uh, <laughs> some people think that this plays into the what Erdogan is doing and also his uh, strong reactions to this uh, burning of the effigy or the burning of the Quran, especially of the Quran. Let's put that that way. Burning of the Quran by, by this uh, right wing student called Toledo. And is that in Erdogan's vision, and this is a focus question, is that a kind of leadership of the Muslim world? And the Tadeen as yes. the protector of Islam. Yes. And uh, uh, probably then, if you believe in this, that there might have been some connection by when Indonesia started uh, protesting, and that is not considered to stop his contact in between there. So rather that the Another thing that is driving this, and has to do perhaps with electoral uh, ambitions, is that by getting this help by such as a burning Quran, Erdogan can step in and show, yeah, I'm the defender of the of Islam of the Muslim world, and I would help him in the election. Or yes. Or so, so you didn't mention that at all. I didn't, and also thank you for for doing that, and that also brings me back to to focus, uh, you know, original question about the worldview and so on, and and. Um, there is this sense that Turkey, uh, you often hear Tur Erdogan when he sp you know, talks about the West and, and the EU and, and NATO and so on, that they think, he, he says things like, they think that we're the Turkey of old. They think they can treat us any way they want. And I think this period of EU accession, where you know, there was high degree of conditionality, where Erdogan was con con you know, and Turkey were continuously lectured and had to adapt, that was a sort of humiliating period. It's almost like the Chinese center of humiliation. It wasn't a century, but, it, but uh, you know, now with Sweden, the tables are turned. Um, and so there is this sense of, a sense of Turkey as a regional power, uh, a major power that needs to be reckoned with and taken seriously. Uh, and Erdogan as a leader using the Ottoman heritage and the sort of the, the Turkic, um, uh, the, 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 the wide s swaths of the Turkic world that reaches all the way up to China, right? Um, and um, being a leader of the Islamic world as well. All of these come together giving, giving Turkey what one of Erdogan's former uh, foreign ministers and, and now opposition party member, uh, Ahmed Davutu called Ahmed Davutoglu called strategic depth, right? And that goes into the Russian Chinese worldview that what we now have is not a, a world order dominated by the United States and Europe, but it is a multipolar world with China and Russia, Brazil, India, Turkey, and that means that NATO membership is still important to Turkey, but it's just one of Turkey's many legs. Turkey now pursues a multipolar and assertive independent. They talk uh, sometimes about strategic autonomy, just like we in the EU sometimes uh, uh, you know, aspire to that as well. So, yeah. So then next on the list is uh, Kevin. Thank you. <coughs> this is uh, super interesting. Um, so I have a question with regards to the future. Um, and uh, we know that uh, regardless of if Erdogan wins or loses the current election, he will you know, sooner or later uh, leave the stage. Um, he is mortal after all. Uh, but so, so I think a question uh, about the future is uh, to what extent um, assuming that, as you said, that PKK is a security threat to the Turkish state. Uh, well, certainly perceived, oh as, such, perceived yeah, as such by many Turks. Uh, to, wha to what extent can we expect a different policy uh, with regards to, Tur to the Kurds, uh, PKK, and, and uh, affiliated organizations like the YPG and, and so on, uh, I I from a different coalition or from a different set of uh, ruling elites? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm question thinking about the question from a kind of realist international relations perspective where right. security threats uh, and threats to the state or perceived threats to the state are paramount and are going to be uh, very important regardless of ideology. So yeah, I guess. No, it's an excellent question. I mean, I, I, thi I think realism has a lot to offer. I don't think, I don't view the, the, the state as sort of a black box though. 
Um, I, I think that the opposition, for the very reasons that you outlined, that this transcends party lines, um, and that the national security establishment in Turkey is really concerned about the, the YPG in, in Syria. That's not something that an uh, uh, opposition government could sort of let go of. Um, so I, I expect an opposition government to also you know, want to make a show of insisting that Sweden sort of implements the memorandum. But I do think that, uh, you know, given that the opposition has said that they want to resume talks with the EU, open up the EU accession negotiations, which I think is unrealistic, but they clearly show an interest in that, um, and uh, that they want better relations with, with um, you know, NATO allies, I, I, expect, um, I expect them to, 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 that they would ratify. Um, I don't think that they would necessarily fold instantly, but I, I think that they, they um, you know, Sweden, I mean, the thing is Sweden can now show that Sweden has made quite significant concessions. I mean, Turkey has pushed Sweden quite far when it comes to, especially the YPG. Sweden has now gone further in distancing itself from these, these Kurdish militias in Syria than pretty much any other NATO uh, country, uh, most uh, at least. Um, and uh, you know, with these new new uh, anti-terror laws and so on, I think you know it's it's um, it's it's it, it is a sort of a um, a real shift and, and something that that uh, you know they can show the the, the, um, the the next government. But you know, it's it's a good question, uh, and I I don't think one should be flippant about it. I think there's a tendency in Sweden to be so annoyed with with these demands and the way that they have been put forth, and with Erdogan as an autocrat which uh, he undoubtedly is, and the fact that he did not uh, signal this to Finland or Sweden, um, that there's also a dismissal of, of, of the content. Uh, and I think the content is such that many Turks, not all, but many Turks, including the opposition, also agree with them. But as I've said, we've made many, many concessions and movements. Maybe I could uh, just quickly follow up on that because I, I, I was thinking about what Paul Levin, the advisor to the Swedish government, <laughs> would say, given that we have these elections coming up for the EU, which are uh, quite a great uh, uh, possibility that Erdogan will lose. It's going to be a messy. Why are Dorn negotiating now? I mean, why not sit still in the boat for a while and see what happens? That's typically what we do when you don't know who you're actually negotiating with. You don't know what's going to stand up. So wha what would you say to the government? Is it really a good idea to negotiate now when they have elections so soon? Well, certain elections? Well, that's a good question. I mean, right now, if, you, if, if uh, we call them negotiations, but they're... Discussions. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing process. And I think the government is saying that, uh, I don't know, Pakta Sundsevanda, we've made this agreement with Turkey now, and we've said that we will implement it, and we will stand by that. And part of the implementation is to have these meetings between the, the, the groups. And I think they still do hold out hope that they might get a, con a, a ratification before uh, the next NATO summit on, on 11th and 12th of July in Vilnius. Um, you know, is that reasonable or not to, to hope for that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't hold out hope. I should put my question a bit more precise. It's true that I mean, you can have meetings without really doing anything. It's just that yeah. sometimes when you have meetings, you should just go very slowly. Yeah. And yeah. Try to what just I uh, what I yeah, we can do and not do anything because you know something is going to change anyway. Yeah. And maybe they're doing it. We don't know that, but uh, it seems the most reasonable, or at least they can negotiate on one on one when you sit in a situation like this. Yeah. I think uh, at this point to sort of say no when Turkey uh, opens up, I think that that would maybe not be wise. Uh, I've been critical publicly uh, of of uh, you know some things. I th I felt that. Um, you know, sending both Ulf Kristersson and then Bilström uh, as well, um, and then planning to send also uh, the Speaker of the of, of Talmannen, the Speaker of, of, of Riksdagen, Speaker of the House of Parliament, uh, and uh, and then also uh, the, the Defense Minister was was uh, supposed to go. I felt that sending you know s you know that kind of uh, you know show of uh, you know uh, of. Uh, uh, love bombing, <laughs> if you will, love bombing uh, Turkey without being sure that you get anything in return. I think that was unwise. I think maybe it was wise for Ulf Kistersson to go. Maybe it was unwise for of Bilström to go. Uh, 
I, I might have been you know, content with, with uh, Ulf Kistachon because for Erdogan who has been isolated for quite some time because of his belligerence, because of his policies towards the Kurds in Syria, uh, having foreign dignitaries come and visit is a gain in itself. I mean, that's something that, that's a win for him in the upcoming elections. He's seen as a statesman now who can wrest concessions from foreign powers. So I thought that, you know, that is, given Turkey's transactional uh, nature now uh, in foreign policy, uh, I would then hold off on those kind of gains or benefits or gifts to Turkey until after we'd given some, uh, gotten something in return. So that would be my, but I do think that, it, that the, the government is right to continue to implement the memoranda because as we, we said in, 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 in response to the previous question, even the opposition will, will want to ha have, be able to show um, th their voters that, that Sweden has made concessions. There's more to be said about that, but we have a question here now from Joe Roses online. So we can get him online and let's see if this works. Joe, we can see you. Can you uh -huh. hear? Yeah, we can hear you, I think, too. Okay. So my question was actually on this same topic, so perhaps in a way it's a, it's a follow-up. One thing that I have seen in some Swedish commentary that's opposed to these concessions is a kind of extreme skepticism. There's no reason to believe that Erdogan will stick to his side of this memorandum. Why wouldn't he just continue to move the goalposts so long as it's politically useful and so on? So it's a sort of hypothetical question because I'm imagining now that Erdogan continues to be in power. But but what do you think of that? Does he actually stand to lose something by not allowing Sweden in? Especially given what you said about some of the ambiguous um, items on the memorandum, such as continuing to oppose terrorism. What what guarantees that it's a good faith transaction that there will be something given in exchange? Excellent question. I I I actually think that it, it you know it that I think that it wasn't exactly a good faith transaction. I think we can say that. Well, I early on I can't remember where, but it, in some radio interview I think at PS I I, I said that you know there are two possible possibilities here. Either you know uh, he it's a political issue. Uh, he he uses this for the upcoming election, but he can use it in two ways. Either he can. He wants to show, the, you know, his voters that he has wrested concessions out of Tur out of Sweden, uh, or he just wants to fight. And if he just wants to fight, then it doesn't matter what Sweden does, right? So, and after uh, after uh, Ulf Kristersson's visit to to Ankara, I felt like. Um, I got the sense that it, he now seems to, uh, you know, he seems to just want to drag it out. Um, so, um, you know, th there is that, but there is also history. So, in 2009, Turkey, um, Turkey, uh, uh, Erdogan vetoed uh, or, s or tried to block um, the uh, the appointment of, of uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen to Secretary General, the former uh, Prime Minister of Denmark, and the reasoning was uh, ostensibly that Erdogan was unhappy uh, with how Rasmussen had dealt with the Mohammed caricature crisis, in which he had stayed silent, in contrast to how what the Swedish government has done with the, the Quran burning, by the way, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, he relented eventually. He held out for some time. But he relented because o Obama apparently um, negotiated a compromise in which he would get a Turkish deputy to Rasmussen, and um, Denmark promised to investigate the presence of a PKK-aligned news station, Roj TV, in, in, in Den Denmark. They did so, and a few years later, they actually kicked Roj TV out. Right? So he lifted his veto. In 2019, literally 10 years later, he blocked uh, NATO defense plans, so-called graduated response plans for uh, the Baltics uh, and Poland. Um, the, the plan was called Eagle Defender. And he did so, it's a little bit unclear because these, these uh, the Turkey officially said, you know, it did not you know, demand something in return. And then the eventual compromise is still unclear. But I it appears it had to do with the fact that Turkey wanted the rest of NATO to consider the YPG and PYD a terrorist organization, right? And it held up that for quite some time in 2019. But that was also resolved. Uh, and it seems to have been both pressure from allies and uh, some kind of compromise. 
So there, there are precedents to believe that pressure from allies and compromise together is sufficient to uh, wrest, uh, wrest concession. So that's, you know, now you guys are the one masters of studying uh, the future, the, the past, as we say with investments advice, past performance is not always a guide for future uh, performance, but, uh, you know, it gives some, uh, some guidance. And I think that, you know, it's also, we should not believe that Sweden is all so important, but Sweden and Finland together joining NATO, that is a major coup. It's a, it's a really strategically significant thing for, for NATO. So I think that, you know, if, if Hungary ratify, were to ratify and Turkey continues to hold out, even though Sweden shows clearly that it has made painful, politically, uh, you know, controversial concessions on the PKK and has done everything, as the Sec Secretary General now says, that it promises, promised to do, and Erdogan still holds out, I think Erdogan will come under increasing pressure from other NATO allies. That's my guess. You know, we, for you now one American uh, Turkey expert who is you know well connected says, you know, s wrote a, a while ago. I have heard more people seriously discussing throwing Turkey out of NATO on during the past ten days than I heard in the past ten years. Right? There is no uh, there is no clause in Tur in NATO to kick them out. Uh, and also, there's this as Gustav and I spoke, uh, you know, er before the talk. There is this underlying uh, long-standing fear in Washington that if you push Turkey too hard, you will push them away, you will push him into Putin's arms, right? That fear is always there. And Turkey is an important actor, regardless of what one thinks about it. It's NATO's second largest army. It's a competent army. It has a, now a, a growing and, and, and quite sophisticated defense uh, industry. It uh, you know, connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. It was the country that negotiated the grain deal that you know, p potentially alleviated uh, a global starvation catastrophe. Um, it is the country that you had to negotiate when there was a refugee crisis originating in Syria, right? So it cannot be ignored. Um, but yeah, anyway, I hope that's a response to your, your question. Why would that do? Very interesting. I guess the thing that maybe I was missing was this picture about pressure from other um, NATO members. And it's interesting to hear a bit about what that might in fact look like. I mean, the Danish example, it sounds like it involved these um, concessions on issues of particular interest, like this um, you know, Danish TV station or whatever it was. Um, but I guess the question is who who might facilitate that this time, given what you said earlier about Biden um, worrying about how the US's relationship with Turkey has degraded. Um, but perhaps it's other NATO members. I don't really know. Uh, or if you think it would be kind of a collective voice from other NATO members who together could apply pressure. I don't know if you have anything else to say on that. Well, uh, uh, excellent question also. It's, it's the question what I ask diplomats from other uh, NATO allies when I speak to them. What, what are you doing? I mean, to <laughs> help out? Can, are you doing anything? What can you do? I mean, uh, so Germany has a very you know, strong relationship with, to Turkey. It has extensive trade. It is very much unwilling to risk that relationship. Uh, there also is this large Turkish con you know, electoral contingency, a Turkish origin uh, uh, diaspora in, in Germany. The UK has strong ties with and good relations with uh, Turkey, uh, and uh, in, in a par partly when it comes to arms sales and arms transfers. Um, I think that what I hear is that UK uh, diplomats and, and, and political leaders, they speak to Turkey, Turkish leaders when they meet them, right? And they try to emphasize how important this is, and they try to convince them that way. Same thing with you know uh, the B the Baltic uh, leaders. They you know bilaterally on uh, uh, two two face to face conversations with Turkish leaders. They also emphasize how important they think it is. So those are kind of soft uh, you know soft uh, uh, pressures. But um, and then you have countries like Spain, which has tr uh, strong economic ties uh, to to Turkey and has very uh, long-standing good relations with Turkey. They could try to use that potentially. Um, but you know, it, many of these countries are unwilling to put that on the line. They want to retain that relationship and don't want to risk it. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to uh, the United States as the leader of the alliance. The United States has the F-16s that it can give uh, Turkey. Possibly, it's not clear because uh, even though the 
So it is one person who's holding it up in Congress. It's, it's the, the uh, ranking Democrat in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's the one who says no. His wife is of Armenian descent, interestingly, uh, I think Armenian Lebanese descent, and he has an Armenian and I think also Greek constituency uh, in his in his home state, um, and he is uh, you know an, an advocate for human rights and democracy in Turkey, and he is very clear he's not going to give this up to to Turkey um, uh, unless you know Turkey you know, does X Y and Z. So I'm not sure Biden can push it through Congress. I'll, when push comes to shove, maybe he can. Um, but Turkey, but the United States also has uh, sticks. I think this takes will take uh, if, if Turkey consists uh, in, in uh, you know holding on to its veto, it will require both carrots and sticks. Uh, so F-16s is are, are carrots, somewhat by the way humiliating carrots for Turkey, for <laughs> because they're not getting the F-35s even though they paid a lot of money for it and contributed to the consortium. And Congress, when if Congress is going to give um, Turkey F-16s, they will do it at the same time as they give Greece F-35s, <laughs> so, right? And Congress, even for a while, uh, had a clause that said, we will only give Turkey F-16s if it promises never to use it against Greek, Greece. And Turkey said, what? Well, I mean, you can't tell us what else. No. So, so they, they, they actually pulled that uh, uh, condition back. But Turkey, uh, the U.S. also has the potential to sanction Turkey. There are sanctions uh, still being uh, planned uh, due to a, an, a sanctions uh, evasion scheme involving a leading Turkish bank, Halkbank. So those sanctions are, have been decided, but they're yet to be implemented, or you know, the nature of them is yet to be decided. Um, so you could imagine uh, a combination of carrots and sticks from the United States. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I guess it will be uh, diplomatic creativity also. Uh, that, that uh, you know, Erdogan will have to make the, the calculation that at, at some point it costs him more to hold out than he stands to gain from it. And that's why even though he w if, he, if he wins the election, um, the, uh, you know, he may still persist after the election, but I think it would be easier for him to make that cost-benefit analysis and land on it's time now to let Sweden and Finland in. Are you satisfied, Joe? Okay. Yes, and thank you. Fantastically interesting. Yeah. Let me just follow up on Joe's question because I am still a bit unclear about this thinking that, okay, so the idea is that, you know, it's so, it's so important to accept a big win for NATO and the United States to get Sweden and Finland into NATO. So therefore, uh, this NATO, different NATO countries will put pressure on Turkey. But let's say that Finland joins. And as we know, Sweden is extremely integrated already in NATO. I, I mean, it's a big win for NATO and just to get Finland on the border to Russia as part of NATO. Why would it be so important, given how Sweden is integrated in NATO, to have Sweden in there? Why wouldn't that lose a little bit of interest as soon as you've gotten Finland in there? I mean, really, you should ask this of somebody who is more ah, okay. sort of w versed in strategic. But I mean, I, I, I speak to them, and I've asked the question <laughs> also. So I mean, I, can, I guess I can convey some of the, but the caveat. It's a, a sli sli not exactly my area of expertise, I have to say. But I mean, it's not mine either. No, it, it has to do with defense planning in part. I understand that being a full member makes uh, all, all the plans. And I mean, also it's about burden sharing and, uh, you know, how do you construct an arms industry? If you're a member of NATO, you could actually do some, um, there could be some division of labor. Uh, uh, you know, we have a strong air force and, and strong uh, naval capabilities, for example, and so on. That means that we don't have to necessarily invest in everything. So that's one thing, you know, these long-term sort of strategic uh, kind of you know, decisions, I think, are affected by whether you are actually a member or not. Um, so let me follow the question in fact. Of course, it's interesting to get Sweden into NATO. Yeah. That's not but how, but how but important but the it time, is. the yes. time, the urgency of time to push I mean, um, uh, you, could uh, you could say that that's why Turkey says that it will let Finland in, because it kind of takes the heat off Turkey a little bit. Uh, so I think there is that dimension to it. But um, yeah, I mean the, the time urgency that that the Swe you know we felt <laughs> in Sweden or many in Sweden felt uh, at the time of the invasion, right? Uh, in February last year, 
has been subsided also because the Russian armed forces that were supposed to be positioned on, 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 uh, on uh, you know, on, on the Finnish and then Baltic borders and, and so on, that they have been decimated in, in, Russia, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and the Russian armed forces have not shown themselves to be quite so formidable as many, many uh, suspected or feared. Uh, so I do think the war in Ukraine has bought Sweden time. I do think that there's a, sl a slight less uh, sense of urgency. But it's also about, yeah, it's about the it next year. Turkey time too, that's the thing. It has bought Turkey time when it comes to the relations field. Not for Finland, they obviously... Yeah, potentially, so potentially. So maybe putting pressure on them for Finland, but not for Sweden. But you, c you could also make the case that it'd be it's a little easier for Sweden to sit back in the boat, as, as people you know like to say it. But the, s the current Swedish government is clearly not doing that. They're emphasizing how important it is continuously. But, uh, uh, but I mean, it also is the case that uh, for uh, reinforcements and troop movements and so on, uh, and to make the Baltic uh, Sea a NATO lake, and to have access to the unsinkable aircraft carrier that Gotland mm. can be, all those things actually uh, mean that it's important to have Sweden also, because you know, you know, you'd have to travel over Swedish territory and, and so on. So there are these issues, um, and then it becomes more more complicated. And you know, we still we have these bilateral agreements with the United States about advanced placements of materiel and so on. All those things we'd have to have individual agreements with. Uh, other NATO uh, countries and so on. And um, it also makes defense planning cooperation between Sweden and Finland, that is quite extensive, I understand, difficult. So there are a lot of reasons why, why NATO really want uh, Sweden and Finland to join at the same time. But, you know, yeah, you, 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 we've heard the Secretary General shift uh, his, his uh, rhetoric on that, saying that we want both to become members as soon as possible, but eh, not necessarily at the same time. So good question. Do we have a new question, I think, in the corner there? Yes, yes. Uh, Skorai, sociologist and up, so, um, freelance uh, research assistant. Um, I will have a question. I have a question about the nature of Turkish military. Um, as you have said in your uh, talk, uh, Turkish military has been a political tutelage uh, in Turkish politics and also was connected very much with the United States as the US's arm, political arm in Turkish politics. 1980 coup d'etat, uh, after 1980 coup d'etat, uh, General Haig said, our boys did it. So, but after 2016, uh, Turkish military was purged, NATO and US uh, supporters were purged. Uh, and replaced by Islamists. Um, uh, present uh, Turkish uh, defense minister was chief of staff. He has Islamist tendencies. So do you think the second largest military in NATO now uh, is an Islamic army, a Trojan horse in NATO? What do you think about the nature of Turkish military which has been always political force as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, so if, I think it's, it's a, another very good question and it goes to the, 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 what we discussed earlier about, you know, what can Erdogan do if he were to lose power? Um, because ov obviously if, if, if it is as you suggest that it might be, that if it's an Islamist army and that it's sort of wholly in Erdogan's pocket, well then he can just, you know, place, you know, the army can go out on the streets and, and he can wrest power uh, by military means. I would just plead uh, ignorance <laughs> or say that I'm agnostic on the question. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Turkish military and it's very hard to read uh, uh, from the outside. He's had quite some time after the purges, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, after the coup in 2016. But uh, the extent, I mean, but the, the, the existing army, you know, had its own schooling system and this long-term socialization and training into the sort of, the, you know, Kemalist, uh, you know, ethos of the Turkish army as the guardian of the unitary secular state, right? Uh, and uh, it's very clear that Erdogan has tried to repopulate the armed forces, uh, and they've opened up their own new, new training academies. 
and I think the new graduates are, in, are, are, are much more in line with sort of the, the, the dominant ideology of the state today. But it is still to me unclear the extent to which they have um, re replaced all of, of the, the, um, uh, the cadre, if you will. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know, as I said before, if, if I would consider Hunisi Akal entirely in Erdogan's pocket. I mean, he did show that he was loyal uh, during the coup, although there's some question marks regarding his, his behaviors also. Um, but I don't, my, I, I, I might be wrong here, but I think he came in as Abdullah Gül's man. I think, he, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong. But, um, yeah, and Suleiman Soylu, the interior minister, who is another sort of component of this deep state, his ties are perhaps more with the MHP, right, and the, and the nationalists. So uh, there are a lot of question marks. I don't, I don't know. And then you have the Eurasianist components in, in the armed forces. Uh, right. They had, they had a, a, a brief moment of sort of, you know, uh, upsurge um, and, and position after the purge of the Gulenists. The Gulenists had targeted them, among others. Um, but I, I think now my understanding is that they have been somewhat sidelined a little bit. But again, it's very hard to read from the outside. The gentleman in the, yeah. Yeah, I'm Atila a philosopher at Stockholm's University. Um, thank you so much for this really interesting talk. And um, my question concerns, um, I think one of your answers um, uh, concerning uh, uh, Gustav's question about um, what to look forward in terms of the elections, why do we presume in the first place that they're going to take place when they are scheduled to take place? And sort of struck me that throughout your talk, um, um, you mostly seem to have assumed um, sort of realist, pragmatist, power, politic kind of motivational framework, but then suddenly you, you said, oh, but there's the constitution. The constitution says this cannot be done, but that can be done. And uh, uh, so if the context were a, a full-fledged democracy, then of course I wouldn't be surprised by this um, assumption of the legal sort of uh, acting as a hard constraint of poli on political sphere of agency. But uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about uh, uh, what reasons uh, there are to to assume the same in the Turkish context. So, is it is it that say the uh, the army stands behind the constitution in some ways, or is it some other political actor that 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 you presume to be there, or 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 Erdogan just doesn't have constitution making majority at this point? So yeah, what what, what is behind this? Well, every single question I get is really good, <laughs> and that's no exception. So, I mean, it could be that just that I'm a little naive. I, I'm a, I'm a blue-eyed Swede, <laughs> right? Uh, but um, um, it's also, I think, this is where the, 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 the why I wanted to make the distinction between, you know, Turkey is not a democracy, but it's also not Belarus. So um, Turks have you know, a long history and gotten used uh, to the fact that, you know, their vote matters and that, you know, things are done, you know, broadly speaking in uh, a, a legal manner. You know, at the same time, uh, you know, there, there are this some instances, you know, Erdogan, uh, with the presidential system, one of the arguments in favor of, of, of that, now I, I may be confusing things now, but I mean, the, the argument was something like, look, it's already uh, this system, uh, even though he's not supposed to have the powers that he wields, he has them. So let's just make this situation legal, right? So, you know, th that speaks in favor of the, your, you know, your kind of uh, question mark around the extent to which the constitution matters. There's also the case of when he built the Sarai that I spoke about his palace, Right, there were concerns that it was illegal because it was built on environmentally protected uh, er, er, grounds, and he, I think, he literally just said, "Okay, stop me then." <laughs> right, so, you know, but to lose an election and then just, or, or to to just not have an election, that is a major, major step. It is possible. I mean, I I, I do include that as one 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 scenario. Um, 
and you know, there's so much at stake for him. It's not just that he can't just go into loyal opposition for a while. It, you know, he risks uh, uh, persecution, prosecu uh, prosecution, and who, uh, who knows? Maybe he would even fear the the, the cut off to face uh, or, or something like that. So. Um, the polarization is so deep, he has driven polarization so deep, the hatred is so deep, uh, the extent of uh, alleged corruption is so vast and, and, and so on that, he, uh, you know, I, I do think that one has to hold that as a possibility. Um, but, you know, so, so but, but when speaking to people in the opposition, they are surprisingly convinced that that's unthinkable. Uh, and it has to do with, I think, the fact that even despite the regular military in incursions, Turks and, and the increasing authoritarianism in Turkey now, Turkey, Turks consider Turkey uh, to be a traditionally democratic state, uh, and they would not accept th that. That's what I hear. But they may be wrong. Well, uh, time goes unfortunately very fast, and uh, it's been an interesting discussion about a very excellent topic. So. I'm afraid the time is out, and join me in thanking Paul for this fantastic uh, seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks for the wonderful question. Now, as I said, we, we have a little bit of an unusual schedule uh, this uh, term because we had a water leak in our seminar room. But we have uh, a seminar coming up, up April 19 with together with Rutgers University. I think we have a title for that now, but I don't have it. Uh, Paul, no, Tim, do you know the title? No. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, but it will be coming up soon. And then on May 10th, we have Ottmar Edenhofer from, uh, he's a professor of climate economics, who will uh, talk, and hopefully then we'll be back in the seminar. There might also be other seminars coming up, so do look at our uh, homepage. Thank you very much.